Time Lords, so I've never seen such a decisive vote as of yet in the Cultural Index. Oh, don't worry, Jarl. You'll always have... Wait, um, I've just got to go reverse the polarity of the neutron flow somewhere. Over there. Away. <clears throat> so, I'm Rick and this is the Cultural Index and today we're taking a look at the Time Lords. Time Lord culture is old. I mean, really old, as in 10 million years of history to build upon. Of course, it's easy to maintain a culture of this length when you have near total control over all of time. For the sake of brevity, we can look into what is considered the modern Time Lords, uh, the Time Lord culture we see throughout the history of the Doctor Who TV series. As there is so much here, and a lot of contradiction, I may do a couple of follow-up vids speaking on separate aspects of their history, but for now, let's give the basics a rundown. They evolved on the planet Gallifrey in the constellation of Gusturbrus, which makes all Time Lords Gallifreyan. However, not all Gallifreyans are Time Lords. Originally, the title Lord of Time was reserved for those Gallifreyan elite who were in favour with the High Council, and allowed the use of TT capsules, time travel machines that became colloquially known as TARDISes. While the Time Lords were not considered warlike by traditional terms of the word, by the time of the earliest Doctor Who episodes they had already accumulated plenty of skeletons in the closet, and were viewed with a mixture of awe and fear by many, often including the Doctor. Time Lord society was divided up into six chapter houses. Each chapter followed various political agendas and valued different skills. Each chapter was represented by coloured robes, which were worn for official functions. The most often seen chapter house was the Predonian chapter, to which the orange and red colour scheme belonged. The other chapters were the Partrex, the Archelaine, the Dromian, the Cerulean, and the Sendeles. These chapters were headed by the Lords and Ladies Cardinal. Already we can see the vast amount of political positions have titles related to religious designations. This summons the image of an ancient order that retains a great sense of reverence for tradition. Grandiose naming conventions for things is a common theme for Time Lords, which adds to the overinflated ego that other species perceive them to have. The likely origin for all these titles dates back to the dark times of Gallifrey. Before they were Lords of Time, they were a culture steeped in mysticism and magic. Each chapter owned a great house, a political centre and a hall of residence. These houses were sentient and self-aware in a similar way to advanced TARDISes. Most children went into these homes from birth and were raised amongst peers. From here they were enrolled in either the academy or the military when they came of age. It was customary too for an eight-year-old to be brought face to face to a temporal rift on Gallifrey called the Untempered Schism. Peering into the unfiltered time stream often elected flashes of disjointed events. This was likely done to confront the child with the magnitude of time and prepare them for the responsibility they faced as a Time Lord. Now, a young Time Lord was free to choose his or her own role in society, however, it must be noted that there would have been considerable pressure from the chapters and peers to conform to a specific role, so often it must have seemed that there was no choice at all. A Time Lord often took on a pseudonym or a title to reflect their commitment to a role. This title of their own choosing took precedent over their real name as an affirmation of who they were. Some sources suggest that natural births were rare on Gallifrey, and instead most children were loomed, a process by which deceased Time Lord DNA was spun together to randomise it and produce the strands of a new individual. Now Moffat's addressed this and says it's not the case in the current run of the 2005 TV show, however Doctor Who contradicts itself all the time and with 50 plus years of stories, I'm including it here anyway, as a sort of footnote. Either way, Family units as we understand them may have been common for the Gallifreyans, but the Time Lords were often meant for a greater purpose, and as such were groomed from birth, away from such distractions. It's not that family was unimportant to a Time Lord, it's simply that the connections with their peers were often stronger than those of blood relatives. Now, the High Council ruled over Gallifrey, and its decisions could literally shape the course of destiny in the universe. As such, politics on Gallifrey were often long, drawn-out decisions that resulted in a final, immutable outcome. 
Well, this painted the image of a Time Lord aristocrat as stuffy, pompous, and often arrogant in their decisions, and they kind of were. At the head of the council was the Lord or Lady President who passed law on Gallifrey, overseeing both military and academic rulings. Around the President sat the innermost council, who consisted of a number of high-ranking uh, positions, again both military and political. The Vice President answered only to the Lord President, however this position was not always filled, and most notably vacant in the times of Rassilon, who was a very interesting Time Lord indeed. The Chancellor was the third in command and oversaw the direction and government for the Academy, Although they did hold some military sway, ultimately the military fell under the jurisdiction of the General. Other positions were too numerous to mention, but included the Castellian, who was in command of the Chancellery Guard, Gallifrey's police, basically, Lords and Lady Cardinals, Under Cardinals, War Cardinals, the Gold Usher, and many other positions of power. Technology is such a part of their lifestyle, and in such casual use, that it often could be mistaken for magic. As mentioned, the Time Lords loved their grand names, so this would have compiled the image of science bordering on magic. Psychic paper, the hands of Omega, thought cubes, for example. All Time Lords have the ability to regenerate. This was a mixture of natural evolution, technological and genetic engineering, and possibly the effects of time travel itself. A genetic flaw in the regeneration process limited a Time Lord to 13 lives, 12 regenerations, after which regeneration was dangerous, often just simply impossible. Like most Time Lord technology, it seems fantastic to us, but it was just another fact of life for them. This isn't to suggest it wasn't without its risks, however, as regenerations, ideally, were conducted in the presence of other Time Lords, with the aid of equipment and occasionally a degree of aftercare. A regenerated Time Lord would have fundamentally different DNA, and therefore a new everything, including a brain. This would result in a personality shift of varying extremes. However, their memories would be left in check, mostly. Their nature may have changed, but their nurture would be the same. A man's beliefs that life had taught him would still be his, for example. It seems, therefore, that Time Lords often judged individuals by their feats over their personalities, with individuals held accountable for the actions of all of their regenerations. Time Lords also seem to have little trouble telling each other apart, perhaps aided by the species' moderate psychic abilities. Some of the most iconic Time Lord achievements are millennia-old technologies. Regeneration, time travel, dimensional transcendentalism… What does that mean? It means that it's bigger inside than out. Although these processes have been refined over the years, eons of non-interference with other cultures and passive observation can have seemed to have stunted Time Lord creativity somewhat. At the end of a Time Lord's life, it was customary for their knowledge to be retained through the preservation of their memories. Each mind was scanned and uploaded into the Matrix, a computer made up of the combined minds and experiences of every Time Lord possible. Although calling the Matrix a computer is like calling a smartphone an abacus. Art still has its presence in Gallifreyan culture, however, as with the technologies, a lot of it seems focused in the past. The Harp of Rassilon is a Time Lord relic, but it shows that music at one time at least was a great part of their culture. Stasis cubes were frozen points of time, images of beauty captured in an instant and preserved in a three-dimensional image on a 2D plane. This casual use of both time manipulation and folding space further reflects the advanced nature of the Time Lords, where such elements have become a common everyday practice. Another form of Time Lord art were paintings, however with a suitably technological twist. The paintings were rendered via computer program rather than an artist's hand. This raises an interesting question. What then was the piece of art? Were I to create a piece of software so intricate that it paints a stunning vista, what would be the artist? The computer program for generating the image, or me for writing the program well enough that it could produce such work? At its heart, the Time Lords are a hyper-advanced civilization whose scientific advancement borders on supreme. The level they have achieved, however, fundamentally limits them. With no real opposition, their culture stagnates, and the creativity that drove them is lost. The very fact that they had to resurrect Rassilon, arguably the most successful Time Lord president, to lead them during the events of the last Great Time War, shows how complacent they had become. 
They may be geniuses, but they have become immutable and unchanging, requiring the mind of one of their greatest pioneers to aid them in a war they could no longer fathom themselves. Speaking of, during the last great time war, a lot of Gallifreyan culture was destroyed, perverted or downright lost as they discarded parts of their history in order to protect what remained, leaving a broken shell left. This is true of war in general, and in their desperation to hold on to what they once had, they endangered it all, and now face a questionable future. So thanks for watching. This was probably the most challenging cultural index I've yet produced. Every sentence in this video has an entire story behind it, whether TV, prose or audio drama. With 50 years of stories, I've barely scratched the surface. I opened this box and discovered it's way bigger on the inside. Still, as mentioned, I'll probably do several other videos on Time Lord culture, so keep an eye out for that. Until then, the choices for next index are either the Sangili Elites of Halo or the Mass Effect Turians. So thanks again for watching. I've been Rick, and if you'll excuse me, I think there's a weeping angel behind.